So the other day, we were going on about the mamas and the papas and how that all the Laurel Canyon were a bit depressing, blah, blah, blah. It was all a bit mad. And by coincidence, I literally found the book I bought Caleb years ago. It's just like, all of a sudden, it's in my face. Oh. <laughs> Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon by David McGowan. So, Laurel Canyon, Covert Ops and Dark Heart of the Hippie Dream. I'll read you the bit on the... Shall I read the bit on the back or just do the introduction? Uh, Mark's here. Read the bit on the back. Sorry, I was just distracted by booking distracted. something. But, um, the but, but bit on the back first and yeah. then the introduction. Okay. 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 Yeah. Well, that was bloody useless. Thanks. But bit on the back. Laurel Canyon in the 1960s. I've got my wrong glasses on. And these ones stop the blue, and these ones, my actual glasses, is back in the shop because they don't work. So I need these for the blue. If you've seen me before, you know I do this. This for the blue light, and them so I can fucking read. Uh, I always say the more glasses you wear, the cleverer you are. I had about three on once, didn't I? Anyway, Laura Canyon in the 1960s and early 70s. Ow, oh, was a magical place where a dizzying array of musical artists congregated to create much of the music that provided the soundtrack to those turbulent times. Members of bands like The Birds, The Doors, Buffalo Springfield, The Monkeys, The Beach Boys, The Turtles, The Eagles, The Flying Burrito Brothers, Frank Zappa and The Mothers of Invention, Steppenwolf, CSN, sounds like his fucking record collection. Three Dog Night and Love, along with such singer-songwriters as Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins, James Taylor and Carol King, lived together and jammed together in the... What's that say? Bucolic. What's that mean? Sort of nice and... Nice jo and yeah, jolly. Yeah. The Bucolic, never heard of it, community, nestled in the Hollywood Hills. But there was a dark side to that scene as well. Christ. Many didn't make it out alive. And many deaths remain shrouded in mystery to this day. For more integrated, far more integrated into the scene than most would like to admit was a guy by the name of Charles Manson. <laughs> it's probably not his fault though, because he was probably an MK Ultra victim. I think it's a very nice bloke, probably. Mark likes him. He's been in prison for like 400 years. He never killed anybody. He's dead now. Is he dead now, is he? I think he died a That's a Mandela effect. I didn't know he was dead. When did he die? Uh, I anyway. Can't, I can't remember exactly, but I think maybe a couple of years ago. Along with this, along with his murderous entourage. Also floating about the periphery were various political operatives up-and-coming politicians and intelligence personnel. But the same sort of people who gave birth to many of the rock stars populating the canyon. And all the canyon's colourful characters, rock stars, hippies, murderers and politicos, happily coexisted alongside a covert military installation. And there's the shrine to them behind my head. My husband's a Satanist. He, he died in 2017, November 19th. Did he? Information. He died in 2017? I didn't know. Mm. There's all these loads of different theories about what happened to him. Like, Neil Sanders goes right into it, but I don't agree with what Neil Sanders says because um, he reckons it's all to do with um, the mob and the mafia and it was all to do with that, which it probably was. But I think it was a bit darker and a bit weirder than what Neil Sanders came up with. But what the fuck do I know? I've not done as much research as him. So I thought I'd read the introduction, because if you're anything like me, you can't be asked to hold an actual book. But I'm holding it for you. So I hope you fucking appreciate it. And I like to do a bit of painting or a bit of something else when um, when I'm reading. Can't be done, can it? So for you, if you're like me, I'm going to read a bit for you so that you can get on with your painting or you can just be lazy like I am. Audio books. Yeah, this is audio books. Yeah. I'm, so I'm going to go to Dragon's Den with this idea. Yeah, brilliant. 
Someone might have got there first. Let's just do the first introduction. The introduction. Village of the Damned by way of an introduction. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. That's probably some song lyric, I spit. Oh, he gets all dramatic, mind. I can do dramatic, so we're, we're okay. Join me now, if you have the time, as we take a stroll down memory lane to a time nearly five decades ago. It's probably longer than that now. A bit longer than that now. 60, 70, 80, 90, Probably longer. A time when America last had uniformed ground troops fighting a sustained and bloody battle to impose some decidedly Orwellian democracy on a sovereign nation. Nothing changes, does it? It is, it is the first week of August 1964 and US warships under the command of US Naval Admiral George Stephen Morrison mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have allegedly come under attack while patrolling Vietnam's Tonkin Gulf. This event, sub subsequently dubbed the Tonkin Gulf Incident, will result in the immediate passing by the US Congress of the obviously pre-drafted Tonkin Gulf Resolution which will in turn quickly lead to America's deep immersion into the bloody Vietnam quagmire. Before it is over, well over 50,000 American bodies, along with literally millions of Southeast Asian bodies, will litter the battlefields of Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. For the record, the Tonkin Gulf incident appears to differ somewhat from other alleged provocations that have driven this country to war. I'm just going to have a little drink. As I'm a bit thirsty. Dr. Zeus, he's been cancelled now. Ridiculous. This was not, as we have seen so many times before, a false flag operation, which is to say an operation that involves Uncle Sam attacking himself and then pointing an accusatory finger at someone else. This is bloody good. What year was this written, mind? Let's have a look. Don't say, can't find it. Anyways, carry on. It was also not, as we have also seen on more than one occasion, an attack that was quite deliberately provoked. No, what the Tonkin Gulf incident actually was, as it turns out, is an attack that never took place at all. The entire incident, as has been all but officially acknowledged, was spun from whole cloth. It is quite possible, however, that the incident was to provoke a defensive response, which could have been the cast, which could have then been cast as an unprovoked attack on US ships. The ships in question were on an intelligence mission and were operating in a decidedly provocative manner. It is quite possible that when Vietnamese forces failed to respond as anticipated, Uncle Sam decided to just pretend as though they had. Nevertheless, by early February 1965, the US will, without a declaration of war and with no valid reason to wage one, begin indiscriminately bombing North Vietnam. Go USA. By March of the same year, the infamous Operation Rolling Thunder will com commence. Over the course of the next three and a half years, millions of tonnes of bombs, missiles, rockets, incendiary devices and chemical warfare agents will be dumped on the people of Vietnam. Fucking cunts, I'm sorry, but fucking cunts. In what can only be described as one of the worst crimes against humanity ever perpetrated on this planet. Also in March of 1965, the first uniformed US soldier officially sets foot on Vietnamese soil, although special forces units masquerading as advisors and trainers have been there for at least four years and likely much longer. By April 1965, fully 25,000 uniformed American kids, most still teenagers, barely out of high school. I'm getting angry because I got kids, I got boys, are slogging through the rice paddies of Vietnam. I'm now getting a really depressed and sad. Oh. It's just so fucking depressing. By the end of the year, US troop strengths will have surged to 200,000. Can you imagine that? Just try and imagine that. How many people can you fit in a football stadium like Wembley? How many people can you fit in there? Uh, 
Well, it's less than a hundred thousand, about eighty, ninety thousand these days. So over two Wembley stadiums, young boys, my fucking sons. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the world, in those early months of 1965, a new scene is just beginning to take shape in the city of Los Angeles. In a geographically and socially isolated community known as Laurel Canyon, a heavily wooded, rustic, serene, yet vaguely ominous slice of L.A. nestled in the hills that separate the Los Angeles Basin from the San Fernando Valley, musicians, singers, songwriters suddenly suddenly as if by magic begin to gather as though summoned there by some unseen pied piper hmm nothing to see here within months the hippie flower child movement is begotten there along with the new star music that will provide the soundtrack for the tumultuous second half of the 1960s and my fucking life can't you can't deny it's good music though Beginning in the mid-1960s and carrying through the decade of the 1970s, an uncanny number, uncanny number of rock music superstars will emerge from Laurel Canyon. Can Canyon. The first to drop an album is The Birds, Love The Birds, whose biggest star will prove to be David Crosby. The band's debut effort, Mr Tambourine Man, is released in the summer solstice of 1965. Nothing to see here. It would quickly be followed by releases from the John F Phillips led Mamas and Papas, If You Can Believe Your Eyes and Ears, January 1966, Love and Arthur Lee, Love, May 1966, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, Freak Out June 1966, Buffalo Springfield featuring Steve, uh, Steve Stills and Neil Young, Buffalo Springfield, October 1966, and The Doors, The Doors, January 1967. One of the earliest on the Laurel Canyon Sunset Strip scene is Jim Morrison, the enigmatic lead singer of The Doors. Jim will quickly become one of the most iconic, controversial, critically acclaimed and influential figures to take up residence in Laurel Canyon. Curiously enough, though, the, the self-proclaimed, ready? Self-proclaimed, you ready for this? Glasses off. Lizard King. Right has another claim to fame as well. Albeit one that none of his numerous chroniclers will feel is of much relevance to his career and possible untimely death. He is the son, as it happens, of the aforementioned Admiral, Admiral George Stephen Morrison murdering cunt. And so it is that, even while the father is actively conspiring to fabricate an incident that will be used to massively accelerate an illegal war, the son is positioning himself, became an icon of the hippie anti-war crowd. Discuss amongst yourselves. Nothing unusual about that, I suppose. It is, you know, a small world and all. He's bloody good, this bloke, I tell you. Mm. And it is not as if Jim Morrison's story is in any way unique. During the early years of its heyday, Laurel Canyon's father figure is the rather eccentric personality known as Frank Zappa. Though he and his various Mothers of Invention lineups will never attain the commercial success of the band headed by the Admiral's son, Frank will be a hugely influential figure among his contemporaries. Ensconced in an abode dubbed the Log Cabin, which sat right in the heart of Laurel Canyon, at the crossroads of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Lockout Mountain Avenue. Zappa will play host to virtually every musician who passes through the canyon in the mid to late 1960s. He will also discover and sign numerous acts to his various Laurel Canyon based record labels. Hmm. Many of these acts will be rather bizarre and somewhat obscure characters. Think Captain Beefheart and Larry Wildman Fisher. But some of them, such as psychedelic rocker, come shock rocker Alice Cooper, will go on to superstardom. Zappa, along with the certain members of his sizeable entourage, the log cabin was run as an early commune, with numerous hangers-on occupying various rooms in the main house and guest house, as well as the peculiar caves and tunnels late in the grounds of the home. Hmm... Far from the quaint homestead the name seems to imply, the log cabin was a cavernous five-level home that featured 2,000 square foot living room 
with three massive chandeliers and enormous floor to ceiling stone fireplace. Sounds sounds like a hippie commune to me, Mark. I don't know what about you. Mm. Kind of hippie commune I might want to frequent. Mm. We'll also be instrumental in introducing the look and attitude that will define the hippie counterculture. Although the Zappa crew prefers the label freak, Nevertheless, Zappa will never really make a secret of the fact that he has nothing but contempt for the hippie culture and that he will create, that he will help create and with which he will surround himself. Given that Zappa is, by various accounts, a pro-military, rigidly authoritarian control freak, it is perhaps unsurprising he will not feel a kinship with the youth movement that he will help to nurture. And it is probably safe to say that Frank's dad also would have had little re regard for the youth culture of the 1960s, given that Francis Zappa was, in case you were wondering, a chemical warfare specialist. Do you get that? Assigned to where else? The Edgewood Arsenal near Baltimore, Maryland. Edgewood is, of course, the long-time home of America's chemical warfare program. Are you ready for the next sentence? As well as a facility frequently cited as being deeply enmeshed in... I'll spell it out slowly for you, just in case. MK Ultra Operations. Okay. Think today... Think brainwashing. Think where this shit starts. Think of this stuff behind me. All this fucking brilliant music. But from the 60s till now, we are the product of all of this, okay? This is why this is more important as it's fucking ever been. It's about time people fucking realise what they've got on their shelf. We realise we still like it. I think that's the secret of it. Curiously enough, Frank Zappa literally grew up at the Edgewood Arsenal. Having lived the first seven years of his life in military housing on the grounds of the facility, the family later moved to Lancaster, California, near Edwards Air Force Base, where Francis Zappa continued to busy himself doing classified work for the military intelligence complex. His son, meanwhile, prepped himself to become an icon of the peace and love crowd. Again, Nothing unusual about that, I suppose. Zappa's manager is a shadowy character by the name of Herb Cohen, who had come out to LA from the Bronx with his brother Mutt just before the music and club scene began heating up. Cohen, a former US Marine, has spent a few years traveling the world before his arrival on the Laurel Canyon scene. Those travels, curiously, had taken him to the Congo in 1961 at the very time that leftist Prime Minister Patrice Lum Lumumba was being tortured and killed by our very own CIA. Not my CIA. Not to worry, though. According to one of Zappa's biographers, Cohen wasn't in the Congo on some kind of nefarious intelligence mission. No, he was there on the contrary, to supply arms to Lumumba. in defiance of the CIA. Because, you know, this is a kind of thing that globe-trotting ex-Marines did in those days. As we'll soon see enough when we take a look at another Laurel Canyon luminary. Making up the other half of Laurel Canyon's first family is Frank's wife, Gail Zappa, known formally as Adelaide Slopeman. Gail hails from a long line of career naval officers, including her father, who spent his life working on classified nuclear weapons research for the US Navy. Gail herself once worked as a secretary for the Office of Naval Research and Development. Sound like fucking hippies to me, Mark. Mm. I don't know about you. Mm. She probably eats lentils. Mm. She also once told an interviewer that she had heard voices all her life. That probably be the MK Ultra programming love, I would have thought. I don't know. Call me fucking cynical. Call me what you want. I can care less. Many years before their nearly simultaneous arrival in Laurel Canyon, 
girl had attended a naval kindergarten class with Mr Mojo Ricin himself, Jim Morrison. It is claimed that as children, Gail once hit Jim over the head with a hammer. Yeah, children and hammers, you know, what can you do? The very same Jim Morrison had later attended the same Alexandria, Virginia High School as two other future Laurel Canyon luminaries, John Phillips and Cass Elliot. Well, in my other video, because I love the mamas and papas, I don't care what you say, Cass Elliot's got the most beautiful voice on this planet. John Phillips shagged his daughter on her, when she's getting ready to get married. Shagged his daughter, got her roll in his joints when she was 10. Then they had an affair for 10 years. It, it, it's just, yeah. She was there. John Phillips' four-year-old daughter was amongst all of this shit. Just, you know, with their litre or whatever it's, quart of LSD. She was rolling joints age fucking 10 for her dad. Papa, John Phillips, more so than probably any of the other illustrious residents of Laurel Canyon will play a major role in spreading the emerging youth counterculture across America. His contribution will be twofold. First, he will co-organise the famed Montre Pop Festival, which, through unprecedented media exposure, will give mainstream America its real look at the music and fashions of the na What's that say? Nascent. Nascent. What's that mean? Beginning. Beginning, oh, up, up, up come, emerging. So, yeah, somehow. Because they even made a shop. It might go into it in a minute. They made a fucking shop. Was it Gail Zappa? Somebody made a hippie shop where it's like, this is what you wear, hippies. This is this is the clothes you wear. Anyway, so America. It, so the Montreal Pop Festival, which through unprecedented media exposure, will give mainstream America its first real look at the music and fashions of the nascent upcoming. Hippie movement. Second, Phillips will pen an insipid song known as San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, which will quickly rise to the top of the charts. Along with the Montre Pop Festival, the song will be instrumental in luring the disenfranchised, a preponderance of whom will be underage runaways, to San Francisco to create the Hate Ashbury phenomenon and the phenomenon. Do, 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 do and the famed 1967 Summer of Love. I should have had a fucking flower in my hair or something. For this shit. I ain't got one. Before arriving in Laurel Canyon, I literally should have dressed up for this. I know, I've got something hippie over here. Look at this. Just out of Woodstock, that. I'm just out of Woodstock myself, Mark. Festival, yeah. I'm going to be fucking hippie in myself right up. Mm. Watch me. I feel like I need to get in the mood. Mm. There we go. Mm. I could get distracted quite easily. Mm. Imagine the people that have never seen this channel and they just want to learn about Laurel Canyon book. Mm. Sorry. Mm. This is what we do here. Right. Oh, I feel more at a part now. Right. Summer of love. Before arriving in Laurel Canyon and opening the doors of his home to the soon to be famous, the already famous and the infamous, such as Charlie Manson, whose family also spent time at the log cabin and at Laurel Canyon home of Mama Cass Elliot, which, in case you didn't know, sat right across the road from the Laurel Canyon home of Abigail Folger and Wojtek Fryowski. I can't say Fryowski, I can't say them words. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. John Edmund Andrew Phillips was, shockingly enough, yet another child of the military intelligence complex, the son of US Marine Corps Captain Claude Andrew Phillips and a mother who claimed to have psychic and telekinetic powers. John attended a series of elite military prep schools in the Washington, D.C. area, culminating an appointment to the prestigious U.S. Navy Academy at Annapolis. If that's how you say it. After leaving Annapolis, John married Susie Adam, Adams, a direct descendant of founding father John Adams. Susie's father, 
James Adams Jr. had been involved in what Susie described as cloak and dagger stuff with the Air Force in Vienna. You know, what's cloak? Right, Mark, if I was to say to you, oh, my dad's involved in cloak and dagger stuff, what would you think that meant? Covert intelligence. Mark's not very loud. Covert intelligence. Fucking hell! There's nothing covert about your intelligence. Well, exactly. <laughs> Cloak and dagger stuff. Kind of intelligence, apparently. <laughs> I've bloody lost my place now. That's the last time I get you involved in this. In Vienna. Or what others like to call covert intelligence operations. There you go. Well done, babe. I told you. He knows what he's talking about, mind. This is very itchy. This. It was itchy in the 60s. It was itchy. You need, if you're going to be funny, you need to do it so they can hear you. It was itchy in the 60s. <laughs> it's just one extreme to the other in this house. Uh, I'm lost now. Or what others like to call covert intelligence operations. Susie herself would later find employment at the Pentagon. Like you do. You know, most hippies find themselves mm. at the Pentagon sooner or later. I'm telling you. Alongside John Phillips' older sister, Rosie, who dutifully reported to work at the complex for nearly 30 years. Are you beginning to see anything here? Is, is there any alarm bells ringing? I mean, fuck me! John's mother, Dean, or D-E-N-E, -E, didn't I spell that? Phillips also worked for most of her life for the general government in some unspecified capacity. And John's older brother, Tommy was a battle-scarred former U.S. Marine who found work on Alexandria, Alexandria Police Force as a cop. Albeit, with, albeit one with a disciplinary record for exhibit, exhibiting a violent streak when dealing with people of colour. So they're racist as well. John Phillips, of course, though surrounded throughout his life by military intelligence personnel, did not involve himself in, much, in such matters, or so we are to believe. Before succeeding in his musical career, however, John did seem to find himself quite innocently, of course, in some rather unusual places. Don't forget, this is the guy in the Mummers and the Poppers who had an affair with his own daughter for 10 years and got her to roll his fucking joints when she was 10. Let's not forget who we're talking about here. One such place was Havana, Cuba, where Phillips arrived at the very height of the Cuban Revolution. For the record, Phillips has claimed that he went to Havana as nothing more than a concerned private citizen with the attention of, you're going to love this one, fighting for Castro. Are we seeing this now, babe? Is, is are things like, are you coming up? Are you, are you, is it linking together? It's just one, remember, remember, one playbook that they've perfected and they're just going round and round and round. One playbook. Because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of folks in those days traveled abroad to thwart CIA operations before taking up residence in Laurel Canyon and joining the hippie generation. It's what you did as a hippie. It's what you do. During the two weeks or so, the Cuban Missile Crisis played out. A few years after Castro took power, Phillips found himself cooling his heels in Jacksonville, Florida, alongside the Mayport Naval Station. Anyway, let's move on to yet another of Laurel Canyon's earliest and brightest stars. Now, this one depresses me. This one fucking depresses me. It's one of my favourite fucking albums, Deja Vu. Ugh. Mr. Stephen Stills. I'm not even joking. When I first met and I started telling Mark about all this shit, he wasn't happy. Were you, Mark? Yeah. He wasn't happy. This was like the hardest thing, wasn't it, babe, for you? Mm. In your great awakening? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, he was. Stills will have the distinction of being a founding member of two of Laurel Canyon's most acclaimed and beloved bands, Buffalo Springfield and, needless to say, Cosby, Cosby, Stills and Nash. I'm so depressed about this bit. In addition... Who's your most depressing one, babe? Well, we don't know yet. In addition, Stills will pen perhaps the first and certainly one of the most enduring anthems of the 60s generation. For what it's worth. The opening lines of which appear at the top of this chapter are... Yeah. 
Stills is, so let's read that out again, the, the opening lines of what it's worth. So there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. American accent. Acting. For what it's worth, the opening lines of which will appear at the top of this chapter, Stills' follow-up single will be entitled Bluebird, which coincidentally or not happens to be the original code name assigned to the CIA's MK Ultra program. Well, I think he's a bit... What a tinfoil hat wearing, woo-woo fucking idiot. It's just a coincidence, uh, David. What's the matter with the bloke? Before his arrival in Laurel Canyon, Stephen Stills was the... Oh, I just thought I'd better check that I'm still videoing. Because oh, yeah. we've been, we've had that before, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, Nearly daily, <laughs> to be fair. Before his arrival in Laurel Canyon, Stephen Stills was a product of yet another career military family. Raised partly in Texas, young Stephen spent large swathes of his childhood in El Salvador, Costa Rica, the Panama Canal, the Panama Canal Zone and various other parts of Central America. Alongside his father, who was, we can be fairly certain, helping to spread, and they've actually got it in democracy, to the unwashed masses in that endearingly American way. As with the rest of our cast of characters, Stills was educated primarily at schools on military bases and at elite military ac academies. Among his contemporaries in Laurel Canyon, he was widely viewed as having an abrasive, authoritarian personality. Nothing unusual about any of that, of course, as we have seen already. I thought that's what hippies were famous for. There is, however, an even more curious aspect to Stephen Stills' story. This really fucking depresses me. Stephen will later tell anyone who will sit and listen that he had served time for Uncle Sam in the jungles of Vietnam. These tales will be universally dismissed by chroniclers of the era as nothing more than drug-induced delusions. Such a thing couldn't possibly be true, it will be claimed, since Stills arrived on the Laurel Canyon scene at the very time that the first uniform troops began shipping out, and he remained in the public eye thereafter. And it will, of course, be quite true that Stephen Stills could not have served with uniform ground troops in Vietnam. But what will be ignored is the undeniable fact that the US had thousands of advisors, which is to say CIA Special Forces operatives, active in the country for a good many years before the arrival of the first official ground troops. What will also be ignored is that given his background, his age and the timeline of events, Stephen Stills not only could indeed have set action in, seen action in Vietnam, he was seemed to have been a prime candidate for such an assignment, after which, of course, he could rather quickly become, stop me if you've heard this one before, an icon of the peace generation. When are people going to wake up? Another of those icons and one of Laurel Canyon's most flamboyant residents is a young man by the name of David Crosby. So annoying. <laughs> Founded member of the seminal Laurel Canyon band The Birds, as well as, of course, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Crosby is, not surprisingly, the son of an, an, an I can't say that word, Annapolis graduate and World War II military intelligence officer, Major Floyd Delafield Crosby. Like others in this story, Floyd Crosby spent much of his post-service time travelling the world. Those travels landed him in places like Haiti, where he paid a visit in 1927, when the country just happened to be, coincidentally of course, under military occupation by the US Marines. One of the Marines doing that occupying was a guy that we met earlier by the name of Captain Claude Andrew Phillips. But David Crosby is much more than just the son of Major Floyd Delafield Crosby. David Van Cortart Crosby, as it turns out, is a... What's that say? Scion. What's that mean? Um, S-C-I-O-N. I've never seen that in my life. Scion. Mark's going to come up with the goods. Uh, not sure. Like icon, maybe? No, Let's I, just I, say icon. A psycon makes it's sense. Probably, probably wrong. It's wrong. Probably wrong. Anyway, read the, read the sentence. All right. Of the closely interwined Van Cold Courtland Van Schl Unbelievable Schule and Van Renesler families. You're gonna to have to look that up yourself. It's like that. 
It won't be icon then. It's not icon. Mark's just covering this back. I can assure you that if you plug those names in over at Wikipedia, you can spend a pretty fair amount of time reading up on the power yielded by this clan for the last, oh, two and a quarter centuries or so. Suffice it to say that the Crosby family tree includes a truly dazzling array of US senators and congressmen, state senators and assemblymen, governors, mayors, judges, Supreme Court justices, revolutionary and civil war generals, signers of the Declaration of Independence and members of the Continental Congress. It also includes, I should hasten to add, for those of you with a taste for such things, more than a few high-ranking Masons. Stephen Ran Ren Rensselaer III, can't say that, for example, reportedly served as Grand Master of Masons for New York. And if all that isn't impressive enough, according to the New England Genealogical Society, check, I'm still taping, David Van Court. Courtland Crosby is also a direct descendant of founding fathers and Federalist Papers authors Alexander Hamilton and John Jay. I've never heard of these people. Maybe American people have. I don't know. Anyway, it's up there and dodgy. If there is, as many believe, a network of elite families that has shaped national and world, event, world events for a very long time, then it is probably safe to say that David Crosby is a bloodline member of that clan. Which may explain, come to think of it, why his semen seems to be in such demand in certain circles. Because if we're being honest here, it certainly can't be due to his looks or talent. <laughs> well, I don't want a semen, do you? No. Mm. No, no, no. That's on record now. Yeah. Oh, I can put that there so you can see it. That might make it a bit more interesting, wouldn't it? But I can't read for that. It's going to be itchy. Bloody hell, hippieism is very itchy. If America had royalty, then David Crosby would probably be a duke or a prince or something similar. But other than that, he is just a normal, run-of-the-mill kind of guy who just happened to shine as one of Laurel Canyon's brightest stars. So cynical, you lot. I guess I should add, has a real fondness for guns, especially handguns, which he has maintained a sizable collection of for his entire life. According to those closest to him, it is a rare occasion when Mr. Crosby is not packing heat. I'm going to start using that in everyday sentences. Yeah. You often pack heat. I pack heat sometimes. Yeah. You had some for your back when you make you yes. I think they're always packing heat. John Phillips also owned and sometimes carried handguns. And according to... Well, that's what hippies do, isn't it? Flower in the hair, gun in the back pocket. Yeah. I thought everybody knew that. And according to Crosby himself, he has, on at least one occasion, dis discharged a firearm in anger at another human being. All of which made him, of course, an obvious choice for the flower children to rally around. I can't see why anybody's kicking up such a fuss about it. Another shining star on the Laurel Canyon scene, just a few years later, will be singer-songwriter Jackson Brown. E on the end of Brown. Interesting. Who is, are you getting as bored of this as I am, the product of a career military family? Brown's father was assigned to post-war reconstruction work in Germany, which very likely means that he was in the employ of the OSS precursor to the CIA. As readers of my earlier work, Understanding the F Word, may recall, Oh, we've never, we've not, we haven't got that one. We have to get that. One. We do have that um, other one. Is it, what's it called? Not why we hate. It's all Pro about program serial, to kill. Program to kill. It's all about serial killers and how they don't just grow; they're made. Program to kill by this guy, David McGowan. He's dead now. U.S. involvement in post-war reconstruction in Germany largely consisted of maintaining as much of the Nazi infrastructure as possible while shielding war criminals from capture and prosecution. Against that backdrop, Jackson Brown was born in a military hospital in Heidelberg, Germany. Some two decades later, he emerged as... Oh, never mind. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. He's funny, this bloke. Let's talk instead about three other Laurel Canyon vocalists who were rise to dizzying heights of fame and fortune. Jerry Beckley, Dan Peake 
and Dewey Bunnell. Individually, these three names are probably unknown to virtually all readers, but collectively as the band America. The three, was, the three will score huge hits in the early 70s with such songs as Ventura Highway, A Horse With No Name and The Wizard of Oz themed The Tin Man. I guess I probably don't need to add here that all three of these lads were products of the military intelligence community. Beckley's dad was the commander of the now defunct West Ruslip USAF base near London, England. Ruslip. Ruslip. That's not what you pronounce that like an American word. <laughs> I've never heard of it. <laughs> A facility deeply immersed in intelligent operations. Bunnells and Peake's fathers were both career Air Force officers, serving under Beckley's dad at West... Weislip. Weislip. That's not how it's spelled, mind. Which is where the three boys first met. We could also, I suppose, discuss Mike Nesmith of the Monkeys and Corey Wells of the Three Dog Night. Oh, it's so depressing, isn't it? Two more hugely successful Laurel Canyon bands who both arrived in LA not long after serving time with the US Air Force. Ned Smith, he's only just died recently. He was a, he, mum was an heiress or something. He invented, was it paper clips or... We don't need a book where Mark's Safety pins, something like, something like that. We'll find out in a minute. We'll find out Mark's all getting all excited, his knowledge. <laughs> Probably. Why don't you make a little appearance for, the, for your fans? Probably totally wrong. Make it like, oh. Oh, he is. Um, Look at him. He's gone. You could have been here. Eh? Add in your little lip. No, I've added my little voice. You put a hat on you. Um, he's only just recently died this year, Nesmith. Nesmith also inherited a family fortune because hippies do because they're all they're all about the yeah hippies. I don't know where you get these impression that they walk around barefoot with no money with flowers in their hair eating lentils. I don't know where you get that impression dickheads no they're millionaires mate all right you're proper hippies you're original hippies millionaires so what are you doing in glastonbury with your flip-flops on inherited a family fortune estimated at 25 million because that's what hippies do mm. Graham parsons who will briefly replace david crosby in the Bird. the He fucking knows it all, doesn't he? Mm. Before fronting the Flying Burrito Brothers were the son of Major Cecil Ingram, Coon Dog, Connor Two, a decorated military officer, and bomber pilot who reportedly flew over 50 combat missions. Parsons was also an heir on his mother's side the to the formidable Snively family fortune. Said to be the wealthiest family in the exclusive enclave of Winter Haven, Florida, the Snively family was the proud owner of Snively Groves, Inc., which reportedly owned as much as one third of all the citrus groves in the state of Florida. There's a lot of oranges in Florida. I expect so. You'd be allergic. You wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to bloody well deal with it. Yeah, good for you. No good for me. Heat and origins. Heat and origins. origins. <laughs> the, or the oranges of the oranges. Got origins, oh and so it goes as one scrolls through the ro roster of Laurel Canyon superstars. What one finds, far more often than not, are the sons and daughters of the military intelligence complex and the sons and daughters of extreme wealth and privilege. Oftentimes, you'll find both rolled into one convenient package. Every once in a while, you will also stumble across a formal child actor like Brandon DeWilde or Monkey Mickey DeLenz De yeah. or eccentric prodigy Van Dyke Parks. You might also encounter some former mental patients such as James Taylor, who spent time in two different mental institutions in Massachusetts before hitting the Laurel Canyon scene, or Larry Wildman Fisher, who was institutionalised repeatedly during his teen years, once for attacking his mother with a knife, an act that was gleefully mocked by Zappa on the cover of Fisher's first album. Finally, Frank Zappa sounds like a wanker. He sounds like he's like the Don of it all. He sounds like he's the... A handler, in a way. Mm -hmm. Finally, you might find the offspring of an organised crime figure like Warren Zevon, the son of William Stumpy Zevon, a lieutenant for the infamous LA crime lord Mickey Cohen. 
All these folks gathered nearly simultaneously along the narrow winding roads of Laurel Canyon. They came from across the country, although, although the Washington DC area was noticeably overrepresented, as well as from Canada and England, and in at least one case, all the way from Nazi Germany. They came even though at the time there were no music industry in LA. They came even though at the time there was no live music scene to speak of. They came even though in retrospect there was no discernible reason for them to do so. It would of course make sense these days for an aspiring musician to vent venture out to LA. But in those days the centres of the music universe were Nashville, Memphis and New York. It wasn't the industry that drew the Laurel Canyon crowd, you see, but rather the Laurel Canyon crowd that transformed LA into the epicentre of the music industry. To what then do we attribute this unprecedented gathering of future musical superstars in the hills above Los Angeles? What was it that inspired them all to head out west? Perhaps Neil Young said it best when he told an interviewer that he couldn't really say why he headed to LA circa 1966 he and others were just going like lemmings that's the introduction and it's the first time i've read it read it even though i know it know it you know what i mean now the next just i'm not going to read the next bit maybe i will but not today so chapter two is power to the people call this a counterculture uh, uh, Everyone there had, at one time or another, been into Satanism. Oh, there's a hook. Or, like myself, had dabbled around the edges for sexual kicks. That was your Sammy Davis Jr. referring to the victims at 150. That one. It's that dodgy. Chalo drives. Chalo drives, yeah, we all know what happened there. Um, I've been there. Mark's been, been there. But That's terrifying. because it's got like a big driveway terrifying thing, so, you couldn't see it, so inspired now this is number two we've also got number one and we've seen him live and he's brilliant mark devlin absolutely we're bloody brilliant. See him again at the he's at the uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see him again soon for the second time at the symposium so he um goes really 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 into depth about all the bands from here and then this one brings it up to date with like modern bands so let's have a look um he used to be a dj himself mark devlin we met him he, he still does right DJ, I think. he still I think, does i think he still does a bit so he's got in his book uh is paul paul um i think he brings it all up to date a little bit doesn't he decoding 80s pop videos um the mccartney mind fuck Anyway, yeah, he brings it up to date and he's very good. So, I just got an urge to kind of remind everybody, I don't know what of, to be honest. It relates to today in such a subtle and subtle and overt ways at the same time. Not necessarily overt to us because we don't watch social... We don't watch it, do we? We don't watch the news. We don't read the newspapers. We don't get sucked into it like us. You know, that is MK Ultra. your telly is literally up. They don't call it a telly programme for nothing. So that's a really overt way that we can see. But I, what I'm trying to say is, I think, we're all subtly affected by it because we all love this music. We, we're all a product of this time and we're all babies in, we're all babies, aren't we, really, in just like seeing the world. It's almost like, yeah, we might have been doing it for 20 years, but I'm not going to lie to you. When this COVID shit came out, for the first month, I didn't want Mark to go to London. I was shitting myself, even though it's so fucking obvious that it's all a load of nonsense. I think we, we've got to remember, I think, that we're still a product of all of this. This is still running through our lives. And I'm trying to end this in a kind of... We've got a long way to go. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I think we've got a long way to go. And discernment 
is the most important thing that we we've got and i think we've got to look at our reaction so i've been doing a lot of work with my clients recently um and we do this technique for clients i work with drug and alcohol it's called the abc's right a is the activating event b is your belief in what happened and c is the consequences of it and for example the, a good example a football a football stadium can hold fifty thousand people right you got twenty five thousand over that side twenty five thousand over that side a little ball goes into a, a piece of string you've got 25 people over there having a heart attack with happiness hugging kissing this best day of their life you've got 25,000 people over that side who just want to commit suicide depressing pissed off maybe angry maybe want to fucking kick somebody in the face the activating event a was the same the activating event was the same for both sides of that football field it was b the belief their beliefs and values in what that ball going into that net meant to them personally that's what led to c the consequences i don't know where i'm going with this but i think it, it i i think we need to maybe be a little bit all of us trying to notice the abcs in our life because if we don't even us with our eyes wide open kind of thing maybe can still be drawn down this um why is that pissing me off uh, why no start off with why the fuck did i just go on social media and give that person a bloody ear bashing or what you know why the fuck did i get drawn into this fucking nonsense for five s seconds whatever the consequences is you can go backwards it's because my belief system even though i know 100 percent that we're psyoped up to our eyeballs Still, I'm in this society that we've been brainwashed since the fucking 60s and before. And then you can go back to the actual activating event and go, oh, it was that. Mark, you're going to have to finish me because I'm just going to ramble on for 50 fucking years because I can't bloody well seem to stop. Uh, Put your hat uh, on. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, well, this has been very interesting. Um, we're going to hear more soon. So I was expecting more, and I think everybody else was. <laughs> no, you just pause it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Anyway, it just so everyone needs to look at themselves and the way they react to things, and consider if their impulses have been governed maybe by something that they've been made to think by what they've seen and heard. There, I I knew you'd come up with the goods, yeah. but there's one thing I've learned. In the last hour, I look better in a hat. <laughs> the hat of truth. The hat of truth. <laughs>